all right? And, and not simply uh, adding math to the algorithms that you have already. So, yeah, so we're, our goal is to try to understand algorithms completely, and you can have different representations for the same object, like this is a 2, and, and that kind of is 2, right? And uh, so, for example, you can write your code, your, you can think of an algorithm as code, or writing an example, or some theoretical thing, or a high-level abstraction. And uh, code, most of you, what you like is code. You write down code, and, you, and, you, and you're happy. Um, the problems, the great things about code is that's what you need to run on a computer, and uh, it's very price, precise and succinct, and uh, people like it. Right? People have the idea that this is all you need to do. Um, but the problem with it is that um, I, for one, I've done a lot of marking in my life, and I really hate marking code. Right? I hate reading other people's code. And if you've read people's code, you know it's hard to read code. Right? So, code is not good for communicating between people. Right? Uh, you need some higher level of understanding. Bo code is much more prone for bugs. Uh, it's language dependent. You don't, it doesn't give you the intuition of what's going on. Right? Another option, people like to trace out examples. In the first many years I taught, I refused to ever trace out examples. But now, sometimes I'm willing to do it. Um, so tracing out examples, you put numbers on the board and you kind of do it. And uh, you say, great. Right? So the, the, the advantage of it, people like it, is it's very concrete and dynamic and visual. The disadvantage is um, that it puts a little box on your screen. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it relies for you to figure out what's the pattern of what's going on yourself. You know, I could just sort of put the numbers out, but it doesn't give you that much more help. Um, and it doesn't explain why it works. And it only kind of proves that it works for the one example, one input that you try. Uh, we could also look at more formal definitions of algorithms like Turing machines or finite state automatists, but uh, we would all groan if we had to do that, right? There, it's very useful for proving theorems, but we're not going to do it in this class. Um, so instead, we're going to try to think about algorithms, as I've said before, in a way that you, would be useful if you were standing on a subway. Right? And you're chatting with your friend and talking about an algorithm. How would you daydream about the algorithm? How would you uh, talk to somebody about the algorithm? Um, for one, I find that uh, most of my greatest thinking happens by, by miracle. You know, I'm just, I'm, I'm exercising or standing in the shower and these ideas come to me. And the, where do they come from? It's, you know, your subconscious has to be thinking about designing this algorithm, right? And uh, your, your, your subconscious doesn't know how to code in Java, right? It doesn't think that way. Your subconscious thinks much more abstractly, and you have to think about the problem uh, in this more abstract way. In some ways, you're thinking about it, not only do you have to be able to talk to your friend about it, but you have to talk to your subconscious about it, right? Alright, so this is kind of like, there's a whole hierarchy of abstractions, you know, we could talk about love, we could talk about firings of neurons, right, and certainly when, if, you know, unless, you know, we could either talk about souls or we could say it all boils down to firing of neurons, right, and similarly, you know, the, the computation on our computer all boils down to AND gates and OR gates, but we don't want to, we don't want to go there, we want to talk about something higher up. Um, so the purpose of it, as I've said, is it's intuitive for humans, and the goal is to how to think about algorithms and design algorithms so that you just know that they work. Um, the people don't like them necessarily because maybe they're too abstract, or uh, if you get if we get too mathematically technical, people panic because it feels like too much math. If we if we're too slack on the math. And then people will panic because it's not formal and precise enough and they don't know exactly what's going on. And so, in terms of this, what I like to do is kind of to do both. Both sort of say things using first order logic and, and math, but also to say things in English and draw pictures. I'm a big believer in pictures. Let me tell you right now, if I, for many problems that you'll be on an exam, 
I have a picture in mind, and often if I see the right picture on somebody's page, then I just mark it right and move on, and I don't even read what you write. Right? So the picture is, is really key. Um, so don't resist it. All right, so this is just, you know, here's a complex picture, and we want to abstract out what are the key elements, right? The key elements is that there's a person who's not very happy, right? All right, uh, um, and then what are the levels of abstraction, right? The first thing is I could give you a concrete algorithm like merge sort. I could give you a concrete input. We could run the, the algorithm on this input and see that it works. Right? That's one level of abstraction. We can abstract this a little bit by still saying we're talking about a merge sort, but now we have to sort of prove that it works on any input. Right? So you say, okay, give me an arbitrary input. I don't know what this input is, but then we have to argue that the algorithm will work for this arbitrary input. Right? And then we can go in a higher level what we're going to do is talk about what I call meta-algorithms, right? We're, we're barely even going to talk about merge sort, right? We're going to talk instead about iterative algorithms, recursive algorithms, and we're going to prove that all of these meta-algorithms work on every input when we don't really even know what the algorithm is, we don't really even know what the input is, right? We don't even know what problem we're trying to solve, right? So it's very kind of abstract. Everybody kind of following what we're doing here? All right. Uh, all right, so as I s on, on every test, you're going to be given uh, a new computational problem that you need to come up with an algorithm for. And uh, um, you have to do it very fast, right? Because one thing that's true is we're very limited for time on these tests, right? And so. Uh, there, there is reason, you know, that it, one's prone to panic in these times. And the problem with panicking is that then you don't work very effectively and, uh, and you don't do very well, right? So the, the goal here is to, is to get you to very quickly come up with a new algorithm without panicking. And the key is I'm going to lay out these steps for each meta algorithm. We lay out steps. And... Uh, um, if, if each, and for each step, then you have to think of what the, the problem is at hand that you're trying to work and do your best to fill in the steps. And if you, get, if you don't get all the details right for every step, then that's okay. You know, maybe you won't get an A+, plus, but you, you know, you'll do fine. Uh, in fact, uh, for, depending on the problem, you know, every detail, you, you simply will not be able to work out in, in the amount of time allotted. Right? So, the goal is to work out as many de a reasonable amount of details, right? And if you don't get them all, that's okay. But if on the test you do anything, anything at all, to convince me that you don't understand the steps, then you will fail, right? You, you must understand the steps. And you say, oh dear, but you know, we're only covering five meta algorithms and each of them have, you know, five to ten steps. So we're, there are not that many steps you've got to learn here. Right? And that's the entire course. Everybody kind of get what I'm saying here? So, you know, when, you're, when you come up with a new problem, the way you're going to do it is you're going to read the problem, what is the input, what is the output, preprint conditions, post conditions, what am I trying to do here, and then you go through the steps and, and you do your best. Um, this is what I just said already. All right? Those are the ones we have to do. Uh, oh, then, then the math that we need to do is, uh, as I said already, first order logic, uh, big O notation. Uh, do you know what 1 plus 2 plus 3 up to n is? Uh, recurrence relations. You know, you just need to know those uh, to analyze the running time of the algorithm. Um, so, so correctness, right, this is, we're, we're kind of going to loop invariance here. The way most people do loop invariance is they write their algorithm first, they write their code first, and 
And in fact, I've watched people code, and often the, the first thing they do is they write down i equals zero, and I say, okay, what's i and why did you set it to zero? And they have no real idea, they haven't really gotten the big picture of what they're doing, they just sort of start there. Right? And then they keep hacking at the program until it seems to work. And then after the fact, they add in a loop invariant. Right? Why do they do that? Well, because otherwise they will fail. Right? But uh, no, here, the first thing that you need to come up with, the very first step, is the loop invariant. Right? It's, 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 the, whole, it's the core of what we're doing, not an afterthought. Um, I kind of said this already. Uh, Alright, so iterative algorithms have the following form. You just iterate. Every iteration you take some step. The goal is to make progress while maintaining the loop invariant. You know, you just... Uh, and, and what I'm going to be saying many, many times through this course is uh, if you try to understand the entire computation, the entire algorithm in one, in your brain all at once, then you will, you will likely not succeed. Because often, uh, I've been doing this a long time and I can't hold the whole thing in my brain. Right? There's, there's studies that say you know, your brain can hold five, six, maybe seven things in it at the same time. All right? So instead, all you do is say, okay, I'm here. This is where I am. What do I do next? Oh, I kind of get a sense of which direction to go and you take one step. Right? That's an iterative algorithm. All right? Um, so many programs are structured this way. You have data stored in some data structure, and that tells you the current state. And, uh, and you, every iteration, you take a step towards your destination, maintaining some property of your data structure. Everybody good? So I'm, I'm talking quick here, and if any, partly because uh, I haven't really said anything yet. But you know, at any moment you think I should slow down, you know, it's your job to say something. All right. So I I often tell stories. Uh, if nothing else, it amuses me. All right. So uh, imagine that we're at home and we're trying to get to school. And uh, so, you know, a precondition tells you the, the state, of, what, what you expect from the input, right? So the input might tell you where home is, where school is. The postcondition tells you uh, that you've, you've solved the problem. You know, we've managed to travel between the two. And, uh, and so what's an algorithm? An algorithm somehow tells you the, the path to take towards solving the problem. Now, this is kind of a funny analogy because this kind of looks like this is the precondition and this is the postcondition, but that's okay too. Maybe this should have been our precondition and that should have been our postcondition. We're trying to get there. Right? All right. So, what's, what's the challenge here? The challenge is that there are an infinite number of possible inputs, and for each of them, we need to describe the computation. And, you know, for each of them, there's going to be a separate path. And not only that, is the path could be very complex. Even if I tell you the concrete input, you, you might not really know where the computation is going to go in the middle. All right, so this is the second thing. Even if we fix the inputs, there's, it could be very confusing where, you're, where this computation goes. Right? If you have a really concrete algorithm that you're familiar with, maybe you have a sense of where it's going to be all along the computation. But, but sometimes that's not the case. All right? So we're going to, the state, of the computational to be defined by uh, everything, you know, you stop the computer at an instance and you write down, or you draw a picture even better of, of uh, every variable, the value of every variable, right, the value of every data structure, right, and that tells you kind of where you currently are, right, it's a snapshot of the computation. Everybody got that idea? And, uh, and so, you know, in this story, you know, if you're here, then the variables have one value, and if you're here, then the variables have a different value. Right? Um, and suppose you are moving along, and suddenly you find yourself here. Right? Now, I'm going to ask the question, you know, what do you do from there? Hmm? 
right? And what what's what in the algorithm do you do now? Do you, do you walk along here? Right, you try to get closer to the st school, and, and wh what is your only task? One step. <clears throat> right, your goal is only to take one step and uh, ideally closer to the school. Right? Um, you take one step at a time, you don't worry about the entire computation. Right? So f from every location you are, you say what step you're going to be, and uh, What's required of this step is that you have some measure about how far away you are, some measure of progress, and uh, you have to get closer. Right? Does that make sense? So, suppose we do, do this. For every state the computation might be in, we, uh, we define a step, and it's guaranteed to get closer. Right? So, from those two alone, are you, are you guaranteed to get to school? Everybody think you're guaranteed to get to school? People are worried. Well, it looks pretty good, right? It looks pretty good that you you kind of you may you may spiral around a bit, right? In fact, I think I have a spiral there. Oops. Do you go back? Do you go back? Previous. Previous. Hello. This isn't working all that well. Now what do we push? Push. No. <laughs> Alright, so you can spiral around, but you keep getting closer, so you should get there. Um, now, the two things that we kind of skipped, well, what happens if you start off infinitely far from school, right? Then you might not get there. So, uh, another thing we'll have to ensure is that your measure of progress is such that you don't you, you start off some finite distance away from school. And the other thing is, well, I'm trying to get to this table. If I go half the distance and then half the distance and half the distance, right? Zeno paradox, right? I won't get there. Right? So we're gonna say that you have to make at least one unit closer. Right? The other requirement, which you think might you might not occur to you, is is you also need that when your measure of progress reaches zero, then you're actually at the school. Right? Otherwise it's a fine. You know, these are reasonable measures of progress. Right? People got to follow that? Well, given those, um, oh, we should be good. All right? So, um, I don't know what that last that line says, but you know, what are the other properties that we need of, uh, of walking? Well, Right? You could be, as you, as you turn to get to school, you could end up in very funny places, right? You could end up up a tree or in the gutter or, or uh, at your girlfriend's house or, you know, who knows, right? And, uh, and you don't want to have to define your algorithm so that for every possible state, you'll say what to do next, right? Some states, you might want to say, hey, I'm never going to get there, right? So, so... By green, I represent those states which are safe. Those states, you know, you're not up a tree, you're not somewhere dangerous, right? These are reasonable states. And, uh, and then the algorithm has to say, if I'm in such a state, and these states, by the way, are going to be those states for which the loop invariant's true, right? So if I'm in a state for which the loop invariant's true, then I have to define how to step, right? Now, what's the requirement of that step? The one requirement was that we make progress. And what's the other requirement? Can I walk over here? No. What's the other requirement? You have to maintain the loop invariant, right? So, um, right, so what is a loop, you know, a loop invariant is, is a statement that's either true or false. And if, uh, if it ever becomes false, then something's gone wrong. You know, your algorithm can put up a little box and say, uh-oh, panic, send an error report. All right? All right, so from every of these, you define a, a step. What's required of the step is that you, uh, is you maintain the loop invariant. Everybody good? follow the, what we're doing here? All right. Um, if, 
So it says if the computation is in a safe location, uh, it doesn't step to an unsafe one. Um, so from this, can we assure that we're always in a safe location? What's, what would we use to prove that we're always in a safe location? Yeah. Uh, you need to make sure you start in a safe location. Now, if we, if we start in a safe location and we remain in a location, how do you know that you will always be in a safe location? There's a word that you learned in... in uh, did you learn it in high school? Maybe not. Learn it somewhere. Um, all right, we'll get that to a minute. The, the precondition states that from the precondition you can establish the loop invariant, right? And, uh, and now we want to say if we start, you know, from the precondition we, we establish the loop invariant and we maintain the loop invariant, then how do we know the loop invariant is always true? What's this principle called? Induction. 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 What's, so in that, by induction we say let s of i mean that after i iterations the loop invariant will be true, right? And for each integer s of i might be true or might not be true, right? And our goal is to prove that for all i it's true. And how do we prove it's true? We prove s0 is true. Why? Because we stop this loop invariant before we've done any iterations. And then with the induction step says that for every i, if in the i step the loop invariant is true, then after i plus first step the loop invariant is true, and hence uh, by induction it's always true. Everybody kind of got that? Somebody asked me uh, last class, you know, do we need to know induction? There, that's induction, that's all the induction you need. Alright? Actually that's not completely true. We'll see induction again when we do recursion. It'll be a slide just as complicated as that one. What's the difference between induction and invariant? Oh, um, well, an invariant is something that must always be true or things go wrong. Okay. An induction is a principle in mathematics in which you prove that your invariant is always true. Right. So induction says the invariant's true at the beginning, and the invariant doesn't vary, then it's always true. No? Induction. See, how do we go back here? This, this is mathematical induction. Yeah. Right? You have some statement that's either true or false for every i. You prove that it's true for 0, for 1. Also, it can be false. No. no. Um, it, right, so, um, let's see, What's, what might we want to prove? We might want to prove that uh, um, the sum of i equals 1 to n of i equals n, n times n plus 1 over 2, right? This, right, so then you could have the statement s of n is that this is true for n, right? Now it's possible that this is, you know, if I got it wrong, then it would be wrong, right? So it's possible this statement, and it's possible that it's true for some n and not true for other n, right? But if I prove that it's true for zero, and then I assume by magic, fairy godmother comes down, assures me that it's true when n is i, and then I use that as a proof that it's true for i plus 1. Then by, we say by way of induction, we know it's true for all n. Right? Why is that? Well, because if it's true for 0, and we prove it's true for 0, and if it's true for 0, it's true for 1, but it is true for 0, so it's true for 1. Right? And now we know it's true for 1. Well, if it's true for 1, it's true for 2. Well, it is true for 1, so it's true for 2. Right? That's induction. Does that make sense? I mean, I guess, I, I don't know, I, I guess I'll learn a bit. I, I just don't know the difference, that's all. Um, well, I don't know. They're, yeah, one is, I mean, they're closely related. Yeah. 
Uh, we're going to be talking about loop invariance for many slides, so we'll see how it goes. All right, so we also need to stop the program, right? You need an exit condition. And, uh, and what do you need? You need that, you know, when you make sufficient progress, right, the exit condition will be met. So, um, right, so somehow we have to prove, you know, that we'll terminate. We'll talk about that in a minute. I guess we've, and then uh, we also, what do we, what do we know when the exit, and when we exit? Right, we know two things. We know that the X condition is true. How do we know the X condition is true? Well, because we exited. Right? How do we know that the loop invariant is true? Because we, we maintained it. We used, uh, right? So from those, from these we need to prove that if the X condition is true and the loop invariant is true, right? Then from that we need to establish the post condition. Right, does that make sense? All right. So, so when I say, um, you know, here's a problem. I want you to describe to me the algorithm. Right? I don't want code. Right? I want you to follow the steps. And these are the steps. And some of them are more and less important. But uh, you know, all the ones that are hard, you need to do. Right? If, if sometimes one is so obvious it's not worth writing down, you can still write down, hey, here's a step, but it's so obvious I'm not going to have to do anything. But, um, okay, what are the steps? The first step is you have to define the problem, and how do you do that? You say, what are the preconditions? What needs to be true for the input when you come in? What's the postcondition? What needs to be true when you go out? Right? You need to find what the loop invariant is. You need to, to give me a picture some, or a mathematical statement or an English description of what you want to always be true as the algorithm proceeds. You know, you want to say, hey, I'm not up a tree or something. You need a measure of progress, which says for every state, how close are you to solving the problem? Um, you need to define a step, which means for every state, if the loop invariant is true and you haven't exited yet, then you have to tell me what the algorithm is going to do next to take one step. You have to define the exit condition, when you're going to stop. You have to prove that you're able to maintain the loop invariant, which means that if, the loop, if you're in some state and the loop invariant is true and you have an exited and you take a step, then you need to formally prove that the loop invariant will be true again. Right? This is a formal proof. You need to prove that if, you have it, if you're in some state and you haven't exited yet, and you take the step, then you make progress. Meaning the, the measure of progress which you define goes, keeps going down. Actually, you could have it keep going up. Doesn't matter, right? And uh, always makes progress. You need to prove that uh, you can establish the loop invariant from the preconditions, right? You need to prove that by me the measure of progress you have isn't infinitely far from your measure of progress when you start. And then ending, you have to prove that if the measure of progress decreases sufficiently, then you will exit. Right? And you need to prove that if the exit condition is true and the loop invariant is true, then you can establish the post condition. So these proofs, are they code proof or mathematical proofs? What kind of proofs do you need to show all this stuff? <coughs> Good question. So, it, it kind of depends on the problem, but for any problem I'm going to give you on a test, usually a few sentences of reasonable hand-waving will, will suffice. So English. Yeah, but you know, sometimes a little math, you know, usually the, the, the proof isn't anything that uh, my grade 11 son couldn't do. You know, it, it, we're not talking hard proofs here. All right. The, sometimes there'll be a little difficulty. You know, I'm not saying they don't want this, but uh, not really all that hard. The, the hardest part, generally, in coming up with an algorithm and doing all this, is your loop invariant. This, this, in some ways, is is the is the art. All right. 
And uh, um, right, so one of the things that makes making up tasks hard for me is I have a you know I've been doing it a long time and I still have a real hard time knowing whether it's going to be too easy or too hard. In fact, what always happens, I'll tell you what happens every test. Every test, as I'm coming in here particularly, I panic. Man, this test is going to be too easy. Everybody's going to get perfect. And, uh, and then what I'm going to do with everybody having an A+. Plus. And then what happens is every, half the class fails it. But that's, you think I would learn, right? But uh, uh, that's the situation. So it's hard to know how hard it to be. And one of those things I try when I'm trying to get how hard it is, if it feels like maybe it's too hard, then maybe I'll give you the loop invariant. Right? Or uh, I'll give you hints here and there. How do we define the loop invariant before you define the steps to get to that? Like, how does that work? Well, we're going to do lots of examples. Um, but, but it's a good question. Right? So one of the big paradigm shifts that I want I think it's useful to do is not to think about, we're going to talk about this a lot, but not to think about an algorithm as a sequence of steps. Right? To forget about the steps. Think about an algorithm as a sequence of states and so that you can get from one of the states to the next reasonably easily and uh, so that all comes into, you know, leap into the middle of the algorithm. You don't want to start at the beginning, you want to leap into the middle draw a picture of what I want to be true in the middle. Right? And, we're, and we're going to do lots of examples. All right, so if we do this, are we done? Um, I claim this is all you have to do to just describe an algorithm. Right? And that these steps are much easier to do. You know, if I was standing next to somebody in the subway, often if I just gave them, you know, here's a new problem, we did to do the pre and post conditions of the problem, if I tell them the loop invariant, then they usually will say, oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense as an algorithm. Sometimes they'll have to say a little bit about uh, how to maintain the loop invariant or something. But suppose we do, all, we're standing on the subway, do we do all of these things? Um, Maybe not. All right. What we start with is we know that when we start the problem, the precondition is true. Right? Because if the precondition isn't true at the beginning, then you don't have to solve the problem. You can just be polite and go home. Right? So if the precondition is true, then we prove that we can establish the loop invariant. Right? And we prove that as long as the excellent condition is not tr true, we can maintain the loop invariant. And so by induction, that gives us that the loop invariant is always true. Right? Everybody follow that? And then... So if the loop invariant is always true, and we define, we prove that no matter, it, whatever, you know, when, no matter what state you are in, if the loop invariant is true, then there's a well-defined step that the computation will take without crashing, right? Then the algorithm will always take a step without crashing, right? People got that? And if the algorithm always takes a step without crashing, and every time you take a step, you make progress, then you always make progress. Right? And if initially there isn't an infinite amount of progress needed and you make, always make progress, then eventually you'll either exit, in which case you've exited, or the progress will go down to zero. Right? And if the program goes down to zero, then we prove that you will exit. So the bottom line is we know the algorithm will exit. Right? And we prove that if the algorithm exits and the loop invariant is true, right, if the exit condition is true and the loop invariant is true, then we prove that from those the post condition will be true, right? We prove that this is true and this is true. We prove that if the exit condition is true and the loop invariant is true, then the post condition, we, we can do some extra code to make the post condition true, right? So then we can make the post condition true, right? Does that make sense? Everybody with me here? And so we're happy. All right, so you've now learned everything that you need to know to, to do this section, right? Because what we're going to do from now on in this unit is do examples of these, and, uh, and then on the test and on the exam, you're going to have to do one of these examples, and 
there will be different examples than we cover in class. But, uh, all right, so um, let's talk about assertions a little bit more formally, right? Those, oh, another thing is I don't have a watch, so you will. I got five minutes? Thank you. All right, so, so this is what we talked about just a second ago when it was asked uh, about how do you design your steps versus standing, dividing your loop invariant. And, uh, you know, people remember this picture. It's by Escher, right? One of the fun things about it is you can either look at the black pictures, right? You can think the black is the pictures and the green is the background, or you can think that the green are the pictures and the black is the background, right? Now, if you're wondering why this picture is not in the textbook, it's because it's too expensive. <laughs> Um, all right, so how does that relate to what we're doing now um, is you can think about the black being the steps that you take, right, the, the actions, and the green to be the states that you're in in between, right? So um, if you're describing this algorithm, you could give me all this code and say, well, you take this step, and you take this step, and then you take this step. And my experience is if you do that, people get lost. OK, where am I now? Right? Um, if you think about, you know, you think about an algorithm as a sequence of actions, right? And you get lost. Um, and the problem is that there are many paths to the code that you can take, and which one are you, are you showing the actions for? Uh, all right, so instead, Minimally, you've got to tell me what the algorithm is supposed to do, right? So minimally, you give me a precondition which tells me that the input is three numbers, right? And the postcondition is that I return the maximum of those three numbers. You know, minimally, you should tell me what the pro program is supposed to do, right? Uh, right, so that's the definition of precondition is what's... You, you all know this already, right? Precondition is what's... The assumptions that are made about the input Post conditions, what you need to make to establish at the end, right? So I would also claim that anybody who wrote this algorithm, even if they hate loop invariants, you know, somehow must have some idea of what's true here, right? Anybody know what's true here? It's the maximum of A and B, right? So. If it's, if it's useful, tell me, tell me right there. What's true right here is that n is the maximum of the a and b. And this is, again, you know, don't tack this on afterwards. Use this to help you, right? You can think of that about the algorithm. You can forget this, the black, right? And you can think, oh, the input is three numbers. Assertion, m is the maximum of a, m is the maximum of a and b, m is the maximum of a, b, and c. Uh, we return, the, we return the max, right? You can think about the algorithm as a sequence of states, and then afterwards it's easy to fill in the steps to get from one to the other. An example like this has no loop in there, then what do you write for looping in there? Oh, well, we're going to get to that example. This is just this is about your easiest example ever. You, you, in fact, you do the same except we have n numbers. Oh. Right? How many more minutes? Four. Oh! Boy, time goes three, slow. Three. <laughs> All right. So what are the purposes of assertions? Well, they're useful for thinking about algorithms and developing and describing algorithms and proving that they're correct. Right? An assertion is a statement about the current state of the algorithm, the data structure, and it's either true or false. Right? Assertion might be the, the amount of money in your bank account is not negative, which uh, for half of North Americans, this is false. <laughs> um, right? It's, it's, it's a statement that's made at some particular place in the computation. Right? Um, it should be independent of how you got to that place in the computation. Um, it should be independent of the input. Right? Whenever you're at this point in the computation, this statement should be true. Um, if it's false, something's gone wrong with your algorithm, and you can put up a little panic box. Um, an assertion is not a task, right? It's a statement which uh, um, is used for the reader to read or, or to help debug your program. 
Um, assertions could be made in formal mathematical first order logic. That that way, you you it's easier to read them. But uh, you know, you don't have to. Often, a picture or uh, a little sentence in English does the trick. Um, all right, so we did this already, uh, and and so here's here's the idea of the loop invariant, and um, I think we've run out of time. Let's. Uh, any questions about anything? Everybody happy? Hour is really short. We get in here, man. We have to move. Of course, we do it three times a week, but. Uh, all right, so if you have any questions, you can talk to me after class. You can send me an email. You can write.